Okay, um, I see we have something like seven minutes. Uh, so no, you have 22 minutes. Okay, all right. But no more than that. <laughs> all right, I'll still talk fast. Um, yes, it's really a pleasure to finish off this interesting set of uh, talks this morning. And this morning, I'm going to talk about a uh, project that I began one year ago and recently concluded. So this is a law review article that's all pretty much all done now. It's ready to go to law journals, but I didn't send it out yet. So any comments or suggestions, um, either after the talk or even by email, I'd, I'd be really grateful for. Um, some of you have heard bits and pieces of this before too, but hopefully it'll still be new. In the most basic terms, this project, in, by the way, I have like six slides, so there's, there's not a lot up there. Um, in its most basic terms, this project is a set of ethnographic case studies of efforts to aggregate health data. Um, even if you know nothing about health data, even if you don't have a deep interest in health data, I still think that this project might be interesting because I'm trying to draw out some broader implications for innovation policy and theory. Um, and that's really how I came to the project. I, uh, in the past, haven't written extensively about health data. I read about the relationship between private transactions and innovation. So what I'd like to do is actually describe to you how I came to this project, and I think that that will help put the ethnographic case studies in the context that I think that they belong in. Um, then I'll talk about the case studies themselves, and then I'll, I'll step back and try to talk about what I think some of the interesting implications are. So this term, um, by I feel goofy asking for a show of hands, but just so I have a sense, has anyone seen this term before? OK, that's, that's good. That makes me feel like I have something new to offer. Which term? Uh, which term? Oh, oh, my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> 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 um, this term. Anyone? Still no. OK. Good. You're just being nice to me now. Um, so this is a term that doesn't show very often in law review articles. But uh, scholars in economics, uh, management, people who study industrial organization and innovation use this term. I believe it was coined by um, Andrew Harkin, and I, I think he's at USC. And this term is used to describe a particular type of innovation process um, by which there are, two student, there are two steps. Step one is bringing together information, um, information of many kinds, I'll explain that. Bringing information together from different sources. And step two, from that pool of information, Developing, recombining it essentially to develop some new technological advance. Um, you could contrast this with cumulative innovation, which focuses more on the vertical process of improving an existing invention. Uh, this recombinant innovation is characterized more by a horizontal process of assembling information to sort of build this fertile ground from which innovations can come about. Um, so. It's, it's sort of a term that floats around outside of legal quarters, really. A good example is Thomas Edison. He had many inventions that you could characterize as recombinant. So um, Edison and his researchers at Menlo Park, they developed the mimeograph machine. This was a combination of two existing technologies. One was the telegraph, the other was a duplication device. It was a, a fast-moving stylus. And Edison was interviewed about it. He was adamant in saying he didn't invent anything new. The mimeograph was just a combination of two existing ideas and a bunch of industrial knowledge that allowed him to create it, um, him and his researchers. So at this point, this should probably sound familiar. Um, although this term is perhaps not familiar, patent law's obviousness bar uh, arguably acknowledges the social value in bringing together information from unlikely places in non-obvious ways. Um, Edison, I think, is also a good example because this mimeograph example shows one way that information can come together, and that's through publication. So Edison and his researchers had access to the telegraph, this fast-moving stylus invention, a bunch of organizational knowledge. A lot of it was published. A second way that information comes together very often is through corporate behavior, um, hiring, mergers, acquisitions. 
this is just another channel by which technological information can flow. So Henry Ford is a great example of this. Uh, when Ford created his automobile factory in Detroit in the early 20th century, he hired engineers and technicians from really unlikely diverse areas to build a pool of organizational knowledge. So he hired people who had spent their lives working on bicycle design, people who had worked in granaries, <coughs> uh, breweries, and from this pool, Ford, the company, was able to develop really important innovations in the world of um, automation, um, the assembly line, which Ford is so famous for, and uh, automobile design and, and manufacture. So those are two examples, but the one that I'm interested in is this third way information comes together, and that's information transactions, um, usually mediated by contracts. So uh, research joint ventures, trade disclosure, uh, trade secret disclosures, collaboration basically through, through contract. Standard setting, I think, was mentioned this morning already. Standard setting is a common example. So a group of companies get together to develop a new technological standard, and they'll often agree at the outset to some um, information sharing plan. Uh, they'll agree to share with one another maybe technological information that's the substance of what they're developing, or industry information, uh, you know, what patents are out there that might be relevant to the standard that we're trying to develop. So again, exchange is a really important mode of information uh, transmission. A uh, famous economist who wrote about this, Kenneth Arrow in particular, but before him, Schumpeter, uh, Nelson and Winter in the 1980s, um, this is recombinant innovation in a nutshell. All right, conscious I used five minutes. Uh, what's interesting and what led me to data actually was the fact that uh, economists predict that these sorts of information exchanges are highly subject to collective action problems. I'm sure many of you are familiar with this idea. Um, these sorts of problems have interested uh, philosophers since the time of Aristotle, and more recently economists, you know, they, they use shorthand to refer to them. Collective action problems, social choice problems, public, um, public choice dilemmas, the prisoner's dilemma. Um, these arguably differ, but people who are interested in them are interested in a fundamentally uh, the same problem, which is a group that might benefit from some collaborative behavior. Um, given a group like that, Individuals in the group may uh, be presented with a choice, which while desirable to the individual, if made by every individual, leads to a collectively irrational result. So uh, Kenneth Barrow, the novelist, was famous for studying how this sort of problem afflicted information exchanges. Um, there's a great deal of literature out there on this that I don't have time to go through, but suffice it to say, um, we have this interesting problem, I think, which is it seems that there is a class of inventions that require as a precondition the exchange of information between different firms and institutions. And yet, economists would predict, or theorists in general from different disciplines would predict that these sorts of exchanges are highly subject to collective action problems. So it's interesting when we think about patent law or even the broader constellation of uh, law, regulation, directed investments that we call innovation policy, that by and large, policy is not deeply concerned with this problem, the problem of uh, ensuring that the preconditions for innovation are met, that information exchanges are likely to take place. There's some uh, exceptions, but you know, the theme of patent law is encouraging invention at the level of individual inventors. It seems to assume that if individuals are sufficiently motivated uh, to invest in research and development, then um, it will happen. This, this suggests maybe not. Uh, I've spent the first 10 minutes now talking about what might just be a theoretical uh, curiosity. What brings it into the realm of practicality, I think um, what makes it urgently practical is this. So big data, this is a buzz term, and I think it's poorly uh, it, it's a very confusing buzz term. Um, but in essence, by all accounts, big data describes a new and promising platform for recombinant innovation. Uh, the reason I say this is when you read accounts of big data in practice, it often involves 
those two steps. There's step one, aggregating information, digitally encoded information, information nonetheless, from different sources, uh, typically different companies or institutions that hold the data. And step two, from that pool of data, developing some useful innovation. The innovations are usually predictive algorithms. Um, and you've probably read about these in the newspaper from time to time. They can predict if crime is going to, the you know, likelihood of crime is going to occur three blocks away in the next month, or in the case of my study, the likelihood that a cancer patient is likely to respond um, positively to a particular course of treatment. So I think what's interesting is the federal government has invested heavily in big data. It's a major component of innovation policy under the Obama administration. Hundreds of millions of dollars have been pumped into promoting this as the next frontier of technology. And yet there are clouds on the horizon that seem consistent with what the theory would predict. Commentators from computer science have been saying, we're not seeing the sorts of innovations that big data had us so recklessly excited about just a few years ago. And in fact, the problem might be a lack of information sharing. Um, Christine Ordman, who's a computer science professor at, uh, I believe, UCLA, she's a leading commentator on big data, wrote about this recently. She said the dirty little secret of data sharing, she was referring to big data, is that not very much is taking place. And there have been accounts in the press recently that are consistent with this. So this was the impetus that led me into this project. Um, it seemed like a really interesting theoretical question, but there was a practical aspect to it. Um, so I decided to take a look at efforts to aggregate big data in practice. I chose health because that's where a lot of the action is. There's major investment of uh, financial capital, of human capital, big players in the world, of, uh, in particular oncology, have been trying to aggregate health data in order to bring about um, innovations that would improve patient treatment. So I conducted a set of ethnographic case studies. Um, my methodology follows the Knowledge Commons framework for these case studies. Um, and the case studies focus on four organizations that are attempting to aggregate health data. Um, because time is limited, I'm not going to get into the details of those four groups. Um, I can let you know instead in general what they're trying to do. The vision is, if we can pull together patient treatment information held by hospitals and cancer care centers, and to a lesser extent, held by pharmaceutical companies generated in the course of clinical drug trials, um, there's a belief which seemingly has overwhelming acceptance among oncologists that it will become possible to provide better treatment recommendations to individual patients than is currently possible. So that's, that's the class of innovation that, um, that these groups are aimed at. And what I found was there are a number of impediments to the exchange of data. There's uh, reason to be hopeful about these projects, all, all four of them, but uh, these impediments seem consistent with the collective action problem. Uh, when you talk to institutions like large hospitals um, and you say, would you benefit from having a pool of patient treatment data collected from across the country, the resounding answer is yes, that would be wonderful. We can, we can definitely do a lot with that data were it already pooled. Uh, when you say, okay, are you going to take your data and put it into a pool, there, there are some powerful disincentives that I group into these three categories in my paper, uh, which I think are discouraging institutions that hold valuable data from contributing to these, these pools. Um, by and large, there are upfront costs associated with taking your data, if you are a hospital or a cancer treatment center, if you're a pharmaceutical company as well, and putting it into uh, a pool. There are substantial risks involved in this. Some of them are real, some may be just perceived, but that's enough to discourage uh, the data sharing. And finally, there's a good deal of doubt um, that contributing one's data will actually yield some direct benefit to the institution or, or the person. So I'll give you examples of these um, with, with our time in mind. Costs involved are primarily costs associated with preparing data for aggregation. Uh, the data held by hospitals is held in many different formats. Many hospitals and cancer treatment centers 
they contract with outside vendors that manage patient electronic health records. And that there are very few of these vendors in the country. They are a notoriously proprietary bunch. Um, they store their data in, many, in different formats that are not amenable to aggregation and exchange. There's no standards, really, for um, the format of this data. So if I'm a hospital, let's say I erase these and, and all I am dealing with is this cost. Still, I, and I wish to contribute my data to one of these efforts, I still need to hire a data specialist to take the information as it exists and translate it into some format that's going to allow for aggregation, some standard format, a common format. Um, also, HIPAA requires that patient uh, personally identifying information be stripped. Um, in practice, stripping it usually removes the value of the data altogether. So hospitals that might want to contribute their data, again, they have to hire a data specialist to obfuscate or mask the data in some creative way, replacing names, shifting treatment dates. It's, it's a bit of an art, really, and it's very expensive when you multiply it by all of your patients. Pharmaceutical companies have similar costs up front. Um, risks. Each institution that seems to hold valuable data, in this industry at least, uh, is facing substantial perceptions of risk. Hospitals are reluctant to exchange or disclose data that might reflect poorly on how well they treat patients. The concern among hospitals is, if I release data that suggests or leads one to conclude the hospital down the block or across town has a better track record, then I'll, uh, I'll suffer uh, lower patient <coughs> minutes rates. Uh, pharmaceutical companies, meanwhile, are concerned with kind of a similar competitive concern. Disclosing data will allow, perhaps, competitors to get a roadmap to future business plans, perhaps a roadmap on how to design around existing patented drugs. Um, that's a concern voiced by pharmaceutical companies. Uh, who I spoke with, I, I interviewed, I, I should have mentioned dozens of people within this universe to try to get a picture of this. Um, Academic researchers view valuable data as the pathway to tenure and, and success and security and happiness. They um, don't want to disclose data. In fact, I spoke with a prominent oncologist and professor of medicine who requested that she be kept anonymous in the study, but she told me candidly, even when a grant uh, funding agency requires an academic researcher to disclose data, it's very common for the researcher to engage in a version of litigation document dumping, data dumping. Take the valuable data, bury it in uh, worthless data, and hope that nobody finds it. Um, so that's apparently a common practice. And finally, individuals are very concerned about the chance that disclosing their treatment records will allow insurers, employers, maybe the dating website they're on to um, <laughs> negatively impact their life in some way. So, there, there's sort of this litany of impediments, and yet there is the overriding uh, acknowledgement or realization on the part of people within this field that if we could just all agree to do this, we would all be better off, and uh, we, would, we would wish to have it done. What I hope to do in this paper is, first of all, point towards a discussion of possible policies that are targeted at these specific costs and risks. Um, an example of reducing cost might be government encouraging greater standardization so that data doesn't need to be manipulated so much prior to sharing. Um, there are examples of the government trying to reduce the level of risk in order to facilitate exchange. So the National Cooperative Research and Production Act was designed in the 1980s with the goal of rolling back antitrust penalties to encourage collaboration. Uh, you can imagine a similar piece of legislation designed to roll back HIPAA penalties, um, or penalties under other bodies of law that um, encourage privacy. But because time is limited, I'll, I'll end with two thoughts, and they're really the two things that I hope to accomplish with this paper. One is very broadly to encourage a broader view of innovation policy in which information exchange is acknowledged as a, an important and valuable precondition for um, certain types of inventions. Not innovation generally, but certain types. Perhaps with big data on the rise, uh, we're going to see more of those types of inventions. And secondly, to encourage a discussion of possible policy interventions that are 
intelligently targeted at some of these problems. Um, so that's that's where I'll end, and uh, any comments I'd, I'd be very grateful for. Yeah, Frank. Awesome project. Thank you. So excited about this project. Thank you. Really, thanks. Great. So, so I've got like a string of comments, and I'll just throw them out. I mean, so I'm going to write That's two minutes. <laughs> well, I won't go for two minutes. My first team on information exchange will be someone on the policy stuff. Like, I said, OECD is having something that data driven innovation should come out in the next month or two that will be re very relevant to what you're doing. I'll have an example to draw on it. Um, Big data can be, it can be one entity or it can be shared. So just, you know, you know, Google does big data and it encloses the data within a set. It doesn't really want to share it. You know, so there's, yeah. I think you got to just sort of, when we're talking about big data, we got to talk about, you know, there's collaborative, shared, open big data uses, and then there's sort of within the entity big data uses. Infrastructure for the pooling, right? So what are the kinds of infrastructure you need for the pooling? Get common data elements, standards are some. Some of them are a biostatistician. Is another you can think that they have a role that they can play across different disease groups. Um, constructions of boundaries around the pool seems like mm -hmm. it's quite important in different contexts, especially in this context. Yeah, there's, risks. There's, right, there's certain people who can get access and other people who can't. Comparative analysis with the EU and other systems for pooling uh, uh, and using data in this way might actually be and counterintuitively be easier because of the medical. Right? So when the system runs a whole series of tests and the data is aggregated in Europe, you'll find that there are certain entities that are already and more easily able to pool huge amounts of data for certain kinds of diseases. So I think it would be hugely <coughs> useful to do that comparison. Uh, I've got a couple other ones. But the last one is just data for treatment, big data used for treatment versus diagnosis versus pharmaceutical use, you know, lowering the cost of clinical trials. Pharmaceutical companies, they're just those are slightly different things that raise right? slightly different questions in terms of managing. Yeah, awesome. I just, very excited. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and the, the fact that Google, the, the big examples of big data out there are often these highly vertically integrated firms. And there are very few examples of the collaborative kind that target in Google and Microsoft. So maybe that's not the kind of innovation we want to have ourselves limited to. Are we, where are you? We're done. All right. I, well, please email me or stop me. Thank you for listening. <laughs>